Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Eliminating Your Company's Component Data Silos. My name is Brianna Curl, and I will be your moderator for today. Before I get started, I'd like to address a few logistics and housekeeping details. If you are unable to hear the presenter or see the presentation at any time throughout the webinar, please let us know in the chat and we'll do our best to resolve any issues. This will be an interactive webinar with a few poll questions popping up throughout the presentation. So please take a moment when the questions are launched to provide some feedback to help us provide you with the most useful information. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the Q&A panel as they come up. We will have representatives ready to answer questions directly during the webinar, as well as during the Q&A at the end. This webinar will be recorded. The recording and the presentation slides will be posted on the EMA resource page. And once they are posted, we'll send everyone who has registered for today's webinar an email with the link in the recording and slides in the next couple of days. With that being said, I want to introduce you to our presenters, Vern Densler, Shannon Henry, and Ed Clark. Vern is a senior product manager at Silicon Expert. Previously, he has spent 18 years at Northrop Grumman as a systems engineer and manager in charge of obsolete lessons management and spares and repairs. Vern holds a BS in computer information systems management from Florida Institute of Technology and frequently speaks at industry events symposiums to assist in furthering best practices in the parts management discipline. Shannon Henry is a technical marketing engineer at EMA Design Automation. She is an electrical engineer from Rochester Institute of Technology and has been with EMA since 2017. At EMA, she specializes in education users on the features and capabilities included in Cadence and EMA technology throughout tutorials and videos to enhance their ECAD design. Ed Clark is a business development director with EMA Design Automation. He has over 30 years of experiences as an IC package and PCB system designer. Assuming we have time at the end, we will field a formal Q&A and thank you for your attention. And now I'll pass it over to Vern. Thanks, Brianna. So uh, we're gonna really kind of delve into four different areas here. We're gonna take a look at long lead times, obsolescence, compliance, and then approved components lists, and really look at how these solutions can, can help with each of these. Um, so it's uh, kind of the format here is we're going we're gonna to talk about each of these um, briefly and then go into a little demo and explaining, you know, how in the, the tools uh, you can get the data on how the data is fed and everything. So Shannon will be doing some demos for each of these. And kind of the overall uh, thing here is, you know, we're really trying to make sure that we're covering, you know, the, the, the main thing. So the kind of the, basically uh, what we're doing here is our new P5, what it stands for is planning. So the first thing is early on, making sure that we're identifying what the issues could possibly be and doing everything we can do to avoid having issues like obsolescence, long lead times, being out of compliance, things like that. The preparer is making sure that we are prepared for when those things do happen. So are the things we can do today to, we know what's coming, but what can we do to make sure that, you know, the impact isn't as bad. Um, the prevent, you know, looking at the supply chain, uh, looking just overall to make sure that we're really keeping an eye on what's what's going on, right? So we're, we're we have a plan in place we're making sure that we know the things we should be watching, that we have the right data and everything that we need to, to do that. And then of course that goes to the next step to perform. So now we wanna make sure we're performing to that plan. We're using those tools, we're enforcing those best practices, you know, doing the, the right things at the right time to then at the end protect the profitability um, 
So making sure that we're not having unplanned costs come up, that you know we're doing our redesigns at the right time, that we're not stopping our production line because of lead times or things like that. So that's kind of the overall thing is to help everybody do a, a better job of identifying the issues early and doing everything they can to make sure those issues don't impact the rest of the production all the way through the sustainment life cycle. Good, good, good point there, Vern. I mean, it used to be easy to predict those risks and now, you know, it, 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 it's a lot different with, uh, you know, you've, you've got bigger companies buying, uh, you know, in, in bulk quantities, but now you've got them looking for those same kind of quantities when production is shut down in certain locations. So it gets even more complicated and it's even more important to be on time and, and be able to predict those risks more accurately. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Adam Fern. So we have our first poll question here, which is how many times have you encountered long lead times for your components? And our options are never, once, two to 10 times, 11 to 25 times, or more than 26 times. Please provide us with your answers and we'll be able to view the results here in a moment. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and let's view our results. So it looks like Majority of you have run into this issue more than 26 times, which is definitely a, a big number. A lot of times run into this issue. So we'll see how we can help solve that for you guys. And I'll pass it back over to Vern and Ed. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, it's a good thing nobody said that. I, I, don't, I don't wanna say it's a good thing. Um, <laughs> Um, it's surprising nobody said uh, zero. It would be better if everybody said they never had this issue, but reality tells us that this is a, a problem. So, yep. um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, why? Well, first of all, it can delay prototyping. So that, you know, that obviously very, very important if you're trying to get a new design going and you're trying to get your hands on the parts you need to be able to, you know, to build your first prototype model and you have long lead times on those parts, well, then that's going to put off your development time. You know, sometimes you can absorb that in production if you plan for it, but when it's your first time buying it, you know, it can be an issue. Um, easily it can stop the production line. Uh, it happens. I've seen it happen too many times where a company will go and they will design a board uh, for a, you know, quick turnaround contract or something like that uh board gets printed and they get the boards in and for some reason waited until after the boards went into order parts and they go to order parts and there's parts that have lead times that are longer than their delivery date and now what do you do because you've already spun the boards so yeah that's it's something that you have to address and and even if you're you know the line's rolling long lead times you can cause the line to have to stop because you couldn't get parts for that particular run or whatever. Um, then of course it can increase your prices, right? Uh, if it's a high demand part that can possibly cause those long lead times and high demand part may be a more expensive part. So, you know, those are really the main things that are the, the problems with that. Right. Um, you know, at any, uh, yeah, right. you know, there, there are a couple a couple of times in my past, Vern, where we'd actually go to a different program and say, hey, you know, you have a, a hundred parts that we can spare from there, or can we steal them from another board? I mean, it was really kind of doing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, things that you normally wouldn't do to try to get by, and then, you know, then those parts might have different tolerances, and, you know, depending if you're running at temperatures, you know, you may have to redesign part of uh, the clock circuitry. I mean, there's just 
you know, the, the, the issues just kind of compound and, and, <laughs> and get even, get even worse. Um, but yeah, so it's really important to, to know this stuff up front and be able to, to plan out the risks as you, as you go along. Yeah. The, uh, paperwork for having to borrow, uh, parts from other <laughs> program is not something that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, look at that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, you know, so we know now the issues of of this. And now we're going to uh, turn it over to Shannon and she's going to show us uh, some of the ways that we can avoid having issues like this. Thank you, guys. Going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so the SE Connect Bomb Risk app can be accessed directly in your design. Or you can upload a bomb and an Excel or CSV file. Uh, just map the corresponding manufacturing information. Once logging in, a summary of the design will be displayed showing the total number of components in the design and how many components are matched and unmatched. Uh, the overall grade of the design can be viewed in the top left corner, either A, B, or C, and all the risk information can be accessed through the links on the left. Uh, let's check out the inventory tab. Uh, so the inventory reports the risk based on the market availability of the components. And here you can view the number of distributors and the budgetary pricing. Each risk category has a visual representation of the risk, as well as a list of the components. And clicking on a portion of the graph or the corresponding category will filter the components for only that risk. So here we have one high risk component in our design. And to view more information, you can click on the part number and here you can view the associated data sheet and additional information on the part. Uh, here in the supply chain tab, you can view the inventory and pricing information. And here we can see that the lead time for the part is 10 weeks, which can be very detrimental to the design as Vern and Ed were talking about. So let's replace this part you can easily view the available crosses. And a cross is an alternative component similar to the original. So when you're selecting a cross, you can review the life cycle, Rojas, years to end of life, reach, the cross grade, and the differences based on uh, compared to your current component. <clears throat> So let's select this part since it's a low risk. Clicking on it, you can view more information. And for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to update my schematic with the new manufacturer and manufacturer part number. Uh, typically, you would want to replace the whole schematic symbol and footprint, um, but for time purposes, we will just update the part information. And going back into Silicon Expert, you can see the inventory has been resolved and we can continue with our design. And I will pass it back to Ed and Vern. You're great. Thank you, Shannon. I, I think it, it's kind of cool if everybody noticed that, you know, all this was integrated in, in the design authoring tool inside of uh, ORCAD uh, Capture. So, uh, you know, as Shannon mentioned, you could do it uh, a couple of different ways, but just being able to do that while you're in the design authoring tool and not have to uh, rely on component engineering as we used to have to do uh, for for them to kind of go and inspect and figure this out. They can be doing that in the background 
and you know giving you an approved parts list which we'll talk about later and uh, that you can quickly and effectively choose from a central library so uh, really really great great stuff thank you shannon yeah yeah and that's that's really the the I guess theory, I don't know if it's a theory, but that's the, the thought behind <laughs> all this um, is to try to make it so that the data is in the right place at the right time to be able to make those informed decision. We're really trying to get communication between the different tools as well so that everybody's armed with everything they need to do it right the first time. And you're not having to log out of one tool, go into somewhere else, you know, Go find the person that knows, you know, what parts you're allowed to use, uh, you know, all those types yeah. of things. Try to make everything a lot more integrated and seamless so that really there's no reason not to be doing it. Absolutely. We used to call that the, you know, in design process or in design methodology where we, we did it as we designed, you know, real time. All right, so I guess we're ready for the next poll question. Great, thank you. So our second poll question is, how quickly do components you need go obsolete? You can choose from never, within one year, within two years, within five years, and within 10 years. I guess it depends on the component. If it's integrated circuits, they change all the time. And if it's, you know, the discretes, they, the availability changes, but the, you know, I, I, 22 ohm resistors <laughs> mm -hmm. tolerance is, is there, but, uh, but that's a, that's a great question. It also so we'll depends on the product life cycle. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and look at our results now. And it looks like majority of you, 58%, have agreed that within five years, components go obsolete. Yeah, and that really yeah. does kind of line up with uh, the data we've seen. Yeah. What have you seen, Vern? Uh, so that, that really lines up with it. It's, you know, okay. five, five years seems to kind of be that peak. Um, <laughs> so, you know, 10, 10 years is probably the real average when you yeah. put everything in there. Um, five years is probably the more realistic peak of, especially for microcircuits and things like that. Yep, I would agree. Yeah. So, so again, obsolescence huge issue. Um, it's you know, it's my uh, kind of it's what runs through my veins. That's how I got into all this stuff. Um, so you know, near and dear to my heart. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it can stop your production line immediately. Um, the, the other issue we, we don't talk about it enough is it's not just production though. If you've got a long sustainment contract or long warranties out there, then you can have issues with that too. So, um, the last thing you want to do is if, you know, if it's a warranty issue, the last thing you want to do is have to give away new product to somebody because you can't repair the old one because you can't get a part. Um, if you're a major defense contractor or somebody like that, then you obviously are on the hook to keep things up and running for 20 years. And then they realize that it needs to be 70 years if you're talking about something like the uh, bombers, you know. <laughs> um, so, um you know, it's it's just, you know, we, we can't forget that. It doesn't stop after the product's out the door. Um, redesigns, um, you know, they get expensive. Um, it's, and and actually just saw a stat yesterday or day before that came out in, in one of the new defense uh, uh, reports um, that I never didn't realize. You know, we always said the average cost of redesign, especially in aerospace defense, is around 500000 and that's a board level redesign. But they have numbers on just to carry a single new part in the catalog, $27,000. Yep. So that's not redesigning anything. That's just putting another part in your inventory. So 
you know, there's, there's definitely a cost associated with obsolescence and not planning it properly. And then of course the increased counterfeit risk, right? Because, you know, the minute something that people want goes obsolete, um, somebody's out there trying to counterfeit it. I mean, they're doing it all the time, even on non-counterfeit or non-obsolete stuff. Um, they're trying to counterfeit everything, but the, the risk really does get increased if, if it's something that there's a demand for. Um, and you have to be a lot more careful because that's when people start looking at the broker markets where they shouldn't be looking. And, and so there, there are a lot of issues there with, with obsolescence impacting, you know, the, again, the entire production life cycle. And the last thing you want to do is mm -hmm. release a design that's a new design and have it already have obsolete parts in it or, <laughs> um, do a redesign, which I've seen happen. Um, and the redesign ends up having obsolete parts in it. So you didn't redesign yeah. all your obsolescence out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you might have to requalify that too with the FCC, FDA, or FAA, you know, the, the, all those agencies with, you know, with the redesign process, they, that may take months or, or even years to uh, put that back into the queue. So definitely something that we didn't want to do. Uh, Vern and I both came from military side of things and, and uh, you know, whether it was, you know, compliance with Rojas or, or anything else, but the, uh, the obsolescence and, and being able to plan for this to, to have a 20, 20 year uh, product life cycle is, is something that you really have to think about as you design the product. So I think we're ready for a demo again. Yeah, let's let's take a look at how we can fix those issues in your design. Uh, so accessing the Silicon Expert again, you just want to make sure you're mapping to the for for your current design. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this time, let's take a look at the life cycle. So the life cycle reports the risk based on the current product life status provided by the component manufacturer. So here you can view the life cycle, years to end of life, and obsolescence product change notices. And again, selecting uh, the visual graph will filter the components for only that risk category. So this design has two high risk components. Uh, one is listed as obsolete and one is listed as not recommended for new designs. So these components can be uh, reviewed and replaced before the design is sent to production. So let's look at the available crosses. And here you can view the alternate components, um, how they're different from your current component, and even supplier recommendations. So we'll select the supplier re recommended low risk part. And again, we'll just update the part number in the schematic, but you would want to replace the whole part in your design. I'm going back into Silicon Expert again. You can see that there's only one high risk component now in our design. So Adam Vern, that I'll pass it back to you. Great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, so again, you know, being able to have that embedded directly, you know, where you're working very very important um you know being able to to know right there what what's the part what's a good replacement easily be able to replace it it's just yeah. it's it's just dreadfully important um yeah and and one of the things we're working on too uh which hopefully won't take too long to get done is the ability to have it, so like if an alert comes in and you're a customer of silicon expert and our um, p5 bomb manager 
you'd be able to assign a task for that alert to somebody working in another tool like this. And so, uh, you know, again, that's that communication we're talking about. Imagine being able to say, hey, can you go onto this schematic and change the part? Um, and then they, it would pop right up in there. They'd see it. They go, yeah, yep, yeah, I see the part data and make that change like she just made. So it's just that that really good integration uh, yep. between the tools. And you know, the other thing is that I like to bring up with these is because the interface that you're seeing is the Silicon Expert P5 interface, if you have somebody that's like your obsolescence guys or whoever that's working directly mm -hmm. in Bomb Manager and they need to go talk to somebody who's working in ORCAD, they don't have to know the tools. They know to be able to go, hey, open up SC Connect and let me show you something, right? And they can show them how to get to the data they want them to see without having to you know, ever have touched a, a schematic tool, CAD tool, or anything like that. So Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I've always found it really useful too. You know, whenever you go into a design review, uh, PDR, CDR, critical design review, and, you know, you just, you know, say, hey, you know, uh, Shannon, launch this thing, Sh you know, run a quick uh, simulation on it. You know, it takes seconds to to save you, you know, literally thousands of dollars or, or weeks in time. And, you know, being able to also see those multiple sources and suppliers and, you know, quickly say, yeah, you know, I've, I think these guys ha have our back. We're not going to we're not going to have an issue here or, you know, we don't need to buy a, a whole warehouse full of these things to, to support this product life cycle. So, you know, really, really good point, Vern. Yep. All right. So I think we are ready for the next poll question. Great. Thank you guys. So our third question is when is the right time to consider compliance regulations? And choices are during the design phase, when procuring components, when planning assembly and manufacturing, or never let the contract manufacturers worry about it. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to answer. Okay, let's see what our results are. And majority of you have chosen during the design phase. Looks like most of us are in agreement there. And we'll see what Vern and Ed have to say about this. I don't know. I wanted to be the one guy to say, let the contract manufacturer <laughs> worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> because, it, you know, you, you really can't be in silos anymore. You know, you, you really have to start thinking about this stuff early and, and often. And, you know, there's none of that, you know, OK, well, you know, it's not my problem. You know, this is something that, you know, everybody's got to got to think about when it comes to compliance, whether you're military, whether it's Rojas, where, you know, conflict stuff, you know, you know, bad chemicals. I mean, there's so many different things that can kind of come up and, uh, you know, and, and bite you. Uh, with that, you, know, you really have to think about it, you know, from from the get go. And yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting because coming from the DoD world, you know, a lot of us will say <laughs> we don't care about any of that compliance stuff. We don't have to be compliant. <laughs> We're allowed to do whatever we want. <laughs> exactly. But the problem is <laughs> that sometimes we forget is that the compliance still impacts the DOD world and, and obviously uh, anything aerospace um, because if the part you're using that is leaded is something that is only being used for your particular product or that product line, eventually the manufacturer is going to get tired of making the leaded and unleaded version. Yeah. And it's probably going to go obsolete because they decided they were just going to make it meet Rojas and you're just gonna have to deal with it. Um, yeah. So that's a problem Yeah. because now you need to know, do I need to do 10 whisker mitigations or something like that? So am I now conformal coding this board because I can only get the unleaded version? Um, so, yeah. you know, it definitely is a problem. And so we can't totally ignore it. 
Um, and then obviously anybody who's in anything that is going overseas, uh, you have to be compliant. And then actually even the military overseas, most of them are compliant. They have to do jump through all kinds of hoops to, to avoid it. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, the new stuff that's coming out that we're looking into, you know, everything that we need to do and getting everything built out is uh, this skip, which really is now saying it's, it's interesting what they've done. So, you know, where we are today is we have to make sure that the product is compliant to be able to be sold in these countries. And, you know, it has to have only a certain amount of this and a certain amount of that. Um, now what the next step with this skip stuff is they're, they're saying, okay, if your product had any of this stuff in it and you met the, the compliance regulations, but you still had any of these chemicals or, you know, yeah. elements in your product, you now have to provide, there's basically going to be a big database and you have to provide that information into this big database so that if it's time to recycle said product, yep. they know exactly what was in there. So they know if they have to do, you know, different types of um, things when they're doing the recycling, does it need to be handled specially? You know, the, does it have to get, you know, divided up so that, you know, part of the, your end product goes to one facility where a part goes to the other, cause one's dealing with lead and the other's dealing with something else. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting interestingly complicated with, with all that stuff. So, you know, now it's not just, you know, do you meet the regulations to actually sell it here? It's, you know, okay, what happens when somebody tosses this thing in the trash can? Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, is it going to poison the earth? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a bunch of stuff, you know, is it cobalt from the Democratic Republic of the Congo? I mean, there's, there's all kinds of uh, lists that are important there. I mean, do you ever wonder why you can't take mercury onto an airplane? I mean, there's all these different substances that, you know, they may interact or react with, with other things that, you know, it could harm the environment or or or, or harm ourselves so yeah. it's it's really really important yeah yeah so it, it even if you think you don't have to pay attention to it you at least got to keep somewhat of an eye on it and if it's something that you have to deal with then you better be keeping a close eye on it so exactly yeah and so uh let's uh let's go for another shannon demo of how we can look at the compliance Okay, Great. we'll load up a new design here. Okay, so sometimes component obsolescence and compliance can go hand in hand. Uh, so let's look at the components with the medium life cycle, life cycle risk. Uh, and here there is an obsolescence PCN. So clicking on the component, you can view more information and in the history tab, you can view any associated documents, data sheets, PCNs, and life cycle information. Uh, so for this part, we can see that it became obsolete uh, due to Rojas conversion, which is, a, which is affecting the compliance of our design. So the compliance reports the risk based on the components adhering to environmental and government regulations. And here we can see the high risk components in the design. Selecting a component, you can view the detailed compliance information, environmental info, the chemical data, and the conflict minerals information. So let's replace this part in our design. Going into the over, overview tab, you can view the available crosses. And let's choose this medium risk part. And we will update the schematic again. Again, you would want to fully replace this, this part in your design. Yeah. 
you know, with the with the integration into the the tools, we'd also know if you know by changing one of those parts, it changed the height or width or any of that stuff because the schematic is linked to the layout, and you know we 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 can easily check for that. And there's a a packaging process that happens very uh, very rapidly, and will uh, is very integrated, just like the integration with Silicon Expert. Yeah, and you have access to all the the documents and things too, right there. So that's what makes it nice. If you need the material declarations, you know they're there. You don't have to go hunt them down somewhere else or anything like that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Does it generate a PDF for you, Vern? That you can just use it as a document. I mean, technically, yes, it will. It will allow you to do that. Uh, the what it does today isn't going to meet the full compliance uh, requirements because um, there's a lot more to that having to do roll-ups and things like that. But, uh, but we do have links to like, you know, the, the material declaration for an individual part. So you can pull it down and store it without having to go out and search for it somewhere else. Perfect. Yeah. yeah the roll-ups get a little more complicated because, you know, you have to, you have to have the fully indentured bill of materials. You have to know, you know, if I've got, you know, this much lead on this chip, but I've got, you know, two of these chips on a board and two of these boards, then it's, you know, how does it roll up into the final? And there's some, and again, you know, coming from DOD, I didn't have to get into it. So I'm learning some of this stuff now um, pretty much by force, but um, the, <laughs> there's, there's some interesting things about the way they calculate it and they've changed it. Um, you know, it used to be that the, like a chip itself had its its uh, amounts and things like that, and then they changed it mm -hmm. so that the the frame of the chip has its own, and you have to even do the roll ups at that level. So it's what's considered a part uh, in there. It used to be, you know, something like a chip that was packaged was a part. Now it's all the parts of the chip are a part. Wow, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> But it's it's what we have to live with. So, okay. Yeah. So, so now we got I think one more uh, poll question here, and uh, yes, yeah, our last poll question is: Do you have an approved component list? Yes, no, I don't know, or I don't care. I use whatever works. Give a moment so you can respond. The, we were just a bunch of cowboys in there. We just did whatever worked and let we threw it over the wall to component engineering and let them figure it out. But it wasn't really the way to to do it. It was just get it done and get it over with. <laughs> So let's see our results. So 82% have said yes, so that's a good sign. Um, and we'll pass this over to Vernon Ed to talk more. Well, I am, I'm a little concerned about the amount of people who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because if you have one and you don't know, he might be getting in trouble at some point. Exactly. Somebody's gonna be knocking on your door. <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, wow. So, well, so really, they could have an approved parts list, Vern, and and you know, uh, not not a centralized library, which would be a yes. problem for them. And that, that 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 way, they would probably be separated, and they'd, somebody would have to go sort it out later on. Is probably yeah. what it is. It, and it may certainly be, yeah. So, um, but it is it is definitely best practice, right? It's you, you yep. should have one. You should be qualifying the parts. It's it really helps with solving the other issues because you know if if you're constantly looking at your component list and looking for the parts that are you know getting ready to go obsolete and you pull that part off your list you know before it goes obsolete and replace it with something that you would rather them use then they're gonna pick that part and not the obsolete part so that's a good thing um, but it, it's those kind of things where you're, you know, you're keeping a little tighter control on the parts you use. Um, one of our bigger customers uh, really has implemented it very well. 
uh, you're not allowed to put a part on the ACL if it's if we consider it a high risk. And they, out of their numbers, 98% of the time, if we say a part is high risk for obsolescence, it goes obsolete within five years. So they decided that that would probably be a good thing to, to not have happen because um, even though they um, are not military, um, they are known in the in their industry for having products that last hundreds of years and um, people expect that if they need a part for you know for this uh, for any of these products they can go to the store with a big green sign on it and they're gonna have you know a part you know for something all the way back to horse-drawn days so um, <laughs> when it when they started putting more and more electronics in there they realized that hey this is a, a big deal and so you know they they really implemented this very well looking at you know what are the high risk for obsolescence again you know they have some compliance uh things too because i guess people um in other countries like green products too um and uh you know so they they were you know dealing with all these things plus cost savings and everything else um you know certainly if you have 20 different resistors on there that are all the same value and you're buying from 20 different suppliers, then you're not getting any bulk discounts. So um, why not have one or two that are approved, right? So it, it's really worked out well for them. Um, and, you know, it, it really, again, is best practice no matter what field you're in. Yeah, and you probably also understand the, you know, the, the electromagnetic, uh, simulation characteristics and the thermal characteristics, so it, it goes even even deeper to, uh, to 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 a system level simulation when you're uh, talking about working with systems of systems and you know making sure that the, the that those parts play nice with with other systems is is really important and making sure that the electrical and thermal performance all kind of comes together at, in the end is 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 really important as well. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Again, you don't want just somebody picking whatever looks good. <laughs> you want to make sure. <laughs> well, and, and again, if it's high relative, it's even more, right? So if you're, yeah, exactly. if you're medical, if you're aerospace, yep. if you're automotive, you know, the parts have to be qualified. I went through to, to make sure that the parts, the parts would stay attached to the board and, and yep. uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an important part of the process in qualifying. Yep. Absolutely. All right, and so I think this is our uh, last demo. So yeah, uh, let's take a look. Yeah. Uh, so with the SE Connect Bomb Risk app, you can easily consider risk information in your part selection for a single user on a design basis. Uh, but the yeah. issue comes in on when you want to implement this for your entire team. Uh, so with ORCAD, CIS, and CIP, you have the ability to create an easily managed centralized part database. So with the implementation of CIS and CIP, your design process is streamlined. Parts can be requested, reviewed, and approved at any points in the design. And if, and if you were a cowboy, Shannon, you wanted to create a, a part, could it be a temp part that could later then be approved? Yes, and we will go through that process for you. <clears throat> awesome. um, so within CIP, you can browse the database uh, based on a, different categories here, or you can perform a database search. You can also perform a distributor search that returns live information from DigiKey, Arrow, Future, Mauser, or NORC. And this information can be used to create a new component for your database um, as a temporary part. You also have the ability to manage and create bombs and throughout the design, part creation, and approval, you can review Silicon Expert's component and risk information uh, through the compliance module. So the compliance summary reports the overall health of your component database, including graphs for each risk category. You can easily search Silicon Expert by keyword or manufacturer. Let's search for a thousand picofarad capacitor <clears throat> so you can review the additional parametric information and risk information by selecting a part. 
And if this is a part that you want to include in your database, you can add it as a temporary part and assign a schematic symbol and PCB footprint if you need to. And this part is then automatically populated with the parametric information and risk information from Silicon Expert. So you eliminate that manual error prone entry of all this information. And this can be placed directly in your schematic. And this, this risk information can then be utilized in your component database to create an approved parts list. So going back into CIP, if you do a database search, you can review the risk information as well as the company part status in your search results. So by reviewing this information here, you can make a comprehensive decision on which part you want to use and ensure the success of your design. The part can be immediately placed into your schematic. <clears throat> and this information can also be viewed directly in your schematic by placing a database part. And within this database, you can browse or search um, all the components in your in your library, and you can view the parametric information, uh, the symbol and footprint, as well as manufacturer and distributor information, and the company part status, which can also be placed in your design. Uh, so the silicon expert data is the same data that supply chain, procurement, and manufacturing use to verify parts and the ability to access a common data set across the organization, either with the SE Connect BombRisk Bomb app or the compliance module in CIP will keep everyone on the same page and prevents the rework. <clears throat> so Adam Vern, that, that's basically the approved parts list in CIP with the compliance information. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Shannon. Yeah, so it, it just makes things a whole lot easier. So um, we do have a couple minutes for questions, and we actually have a pertinent question um, that that relates to this. So the uh, question is, are there uh, plans in the future to be able to hold approved components list in the bomb manager tool? Um, so we can already hold approved components lists in bomb manager, and actually it comes standard in the, the new P5 version. What we do have planned in the future is in the very near future, actually, is that SE Connect will be able to look at that approved components list and we'll be able to tell you when you're looking within ORCAD if that's on your approved components list or not. Um, and then one of the other things we're looking to do is from CIP, have that be able to automatically update the approved components list and bomb manager so the two stay in sync um, and really kind of get it um, all integrated. So if you're in doing a parametric search in uh, SE Connect and you find a part that's not on your approved components list, you would be able to then kick off the uh, request in CIP, have it approved. Once CIP says, yes, this is a good part, have that updated in Bomb Manager so it shows up in SE Connect. So that's really the, the integration we're trying to get between all these things just to make everybody's life a lot easier. Good point. Did, did we mention what you know, we always use acronyms? It's like working for a, a military yeah. uh, company. <laughs> uh, so CIP is a component information portal and CIS is Shannon what, component information, the component system. information system. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so those are all integrated completely into the schematic caption portion. So Shannon made it look easy. Like, you know, like it's, Oh, I can just, search through these components. I can find one on one of the suppliers, you know, Avnet or, or, um, or DigiKey or, or Ultra Librarian and, you know, just, you know, make sure that these are approved, search, add it to my schematic and, and I'm off to the races. In fact, I could do an initial placement on the printed circuit board and, and, you know, then start to import some 
3D mechanical, you know, assemblies and, and everything else and just kind of do that uh, ECAD, MCAD collaboration with parts and, and, and manufacturing all at the same time. So it's uh, pretty darn cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the, the other interesting things that we're working on with, the, you mentioned Ultra Librarian, um, so we're working on bringing the footprints and symbols uh, into SE Connect. We already have them in our P5 platform. And um, they're working on getting it set up so that it's drag and drop into ORCAD. So how nice would that be to be able to use that fee for parametric search, be able to filter on parts that have a footprint and a symbol, and then drag it right into your schematic. So that's, you know. I'm, absolutely. I, I yes. want to find parts, not create parts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the days of me me going in and, and trying to figure out, you know, from the information data sheets and, and try to build that part are, you know, nobody wants to do, do that anymore. I want to search, find it, it's approved, uh, you know, place it into my, my, my system. It's got the footprint, it's got the schematic symbol. And actually a lot of those parts in, inside of Ultra Librarian, there's 16 million parts in there, you know, have 3D uh, solid models associated with them, step models associated with them too. So when you're doing the electromechanical uh, fitting and checking, you know, you have all that information as well. So now you, you really have all your bases covered. Yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, the future's great. And, you know, again, we're trying to, a lot of this is we're trying to really eliminate you know these silos especially now you know it's before and i you know i don't know how it is in in other companies i know in it's pretty much this way in all any defense contractor but you know they're the groups are so segregated right you've got yeah. you know the procurement people um are doing straight procurement they don't really know anything about electronics they're just told to order something um some companies, they're the ones that are doing obsolescence management, too. That's not a very good thing. Um, when I, I, I lived in product support or logistics, doing obsolescence management and spares and repairs, um, you know, was not tied to engineering at all. Um, didn't, didn't know who was in engineering, barely knew who was in procurement. Um, dealt with different people who were on the procurement, but were on the contractor side. So, you know, if I was looking to get documents from a, a contractor, it was the procurement, you know, person that was doing the contractor management, not, you know, ordering parts. Um, and so I had 30 different people I had to deal with. We all were in different departments and different organizations, sometimes in different sectors. Yeah. I mean, that's the way Northrop is now is, you know, all the engineering's in a completely different sector. So, um, yeah. And even the smaller companies now, Vern, you know, with COVID, everybody working at home, you might as right. well look at it as, you know, you, you've got a 50 person team and <laughs> it's 50 different sectors because everybody's kind of in their, in their own place. And now, now you've got a platform, you know, this is really kind of a, a, a design platform where, you know, you can collaborate with, the, with, with all these people that you would have normally been siloed and you can do it with all the integration with silicon expert in integrated into into the de design authoring tools into the checking for uh for compliance into obsolescence lead times you know it, it's just it, it really is a a collaborative design platform yeah and that's that's really you know what we're trying to fix is those problems that that we lived with every day and we're trying to make that easier for people so that you know especially like you said given that you know everybody's now working remotely and, and <laughs> even more separated than we used to be yeah. you know trying to at least be able to interact and and solve these issues together um because you can't just throw it over the wall today it just doesn't yeah. work no yeah. no good stuff yeah, yeah. so i think unless we have any other questions that sums up all the questions we have so far um if anyone has any other questions even after this webinar please feel free to reach out to us uh, you can find our contact information on the slide there um and i also want to remind everyone that we'll be sending out a recorded version of the webinar with the presentation within the next couple of days so keep your eye out for that as well 
And with that, I guess we'll wrap up. And I thank everyone for joining us today. And I thank Vern and Ed and Shannon for the great job you guys did today. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks, yes, Vern. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank, thanks, uh, Brianna, for being the uh, host. <laughs> You're welcome. I hope everyone has a good night or afternoon or wherever you are in the world. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>